point in advance. But it's going to be full, the whole thing. We're going to have chicken. Um, I, I've tasted, uh, a bunch of us have tasted the chicken from the people who are going to make it. Delicious, best chicken I've ever tasted. Um, the chicken is good. We're going to have hot dogs and, and corn. And um, we're having a basket raffle. So giving you a heads up, especially uh, if you see sales and you'd like to buy stuff for a, to donate to a basket raffle, we would appreciate that. Uh, but it is June 5th, and we will be letting you know uh, as it goes along. Uh, we will be having commercials up here. I believe they will be funny. I believe they'll be witty. They will be very talented. I'm just looking at the person who's going to do them. <laughs> Praise God. And she is talented, witty, and funny. So, praise God. Um, also, uh, April 15th, we're having a Good Friday service. Uh, Evelyn and uh, her crew and some of the music ministry are getting together. And it's going to be a time of just worship and praise. And uh, I, I've gone through the song list that, that uh, is going to be played. It's beautiful. It really is. So, I believe it is at 7 o'clock on Friday, April 15th. So, put that on your calendar, please. And there is a National Day of Prayer coming up. Uh, there's actually uh, a pre-National Day of Prayer coming up uh, that we'll be telling you about uh, next week, uh, where a bunch of people who are coordinating this are going to get together and pray for the National Day of Prayer. And uh, I'll be talking about that next week. But just an FYI, uh, that's coming up in about a month. Okay, um, I think that's about it. We're going to have communion and then offering. Uh, Pastor Frank? As I was going over what to minister concerning communion, I want to just share a scripture that many people take out of context. And it's 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 23. And it talks about, for I received from the Lord. A lot of people miss that from, for I received from the Lord. This is a revelation that Paul received from the Lord. And it goes on and it says, he goes on and says, that which I delivered to you, the Lord Jesus, on the same night in which we, he was betrayed, took the bread. And he goes into that whole discourse there. But I want to, and he goes on and says, For as often as you eat this bread, drink this cup, and proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. This is where I believe a lot of people miss it in this communion discourse. It goes on and says, examine yourself. And, and people say, and they look at that from a negative perspective. Well, I better examine myself because if I examine myself, do you know what? Then, so they start looking for the negative. And, and then all of a sudden, maybe they feel guilty or, or they're looking. Jesus didn't say examine, your, or Paul didn't say examine yourself in light of what you did. He said examine yourself in light of what he did. That's why when he goes on and says, if you drink this in an unworthy manner, you are not unworthy. And the manner that you do it in is a distrust if you do it in an unworthy manner because you see, you're righteous. So when he says examine yourself, you're to examine yourself righteous that's why when they he got revelation of the bread and the, the bread and the wine, he said, look, this is a, a before I'm showing you the revelation of what's going to happen. So now you can exa examine yourself righteous. Now, every time you drink the blood and uh, the grape juice and the bread, now you can say, Lord, I'm worthy. I've examined myself and Lord, I'm coming to the cross. And Lord, if there is any sin in me, search me, Lord, and, and lead me into the way everlasting. People are examining, well, did I, didn't I? You know, I got to dig deep in my heart. No, that's why many eat 
and they go to sleep and they die early because they're not discerning what Jesus did on the cross when they partake of the bread and the wine. And so therefore, when they do that, what does he say? Do this in remembrance in me. What's the remembering? He healed all my diseases. He he forgave all my sins. What did he say in Psalm 103? He says, "Bless the Lord, O my soul, who forgives all, who forgives all my sins, who heals all my diseases." So when we do the communion today, I want you to do it in remembrance, not looking for sin, but examining and looking at your worthy you're righteous. I can come boldly to the throne room of grace. And when I'm doing it, because I'm worthy and I'm doing it in a deserving... Listen, you don't have to do this. You're not unworthy. Now, there's a difference between unworthily and unworthy. You're worthy. And many people are taking it in an un worthy manner and Jesus broke the bread and he took the communion saying you're worthy so you awaken to righteousness and when you see the righteousness of God dwelling in you he says awaken to righteousness and sin not when you awake to the fact that you're the righteousness of God you're not going to want to sin but people look at themselves in this 1 Corinthians 11 and it says examine yourself don't go looking for the sin. You know when you sin. You go boldly to the throne room of grace. You go to 1 John 1, 9, but he says, for this reason, many drink judgment to themselves, not discerning the Lord's body. The discerning of the Lord's body is your righteous. The discerning of the Lord's body is your forgiven. For this reason, many are weak and sick, and among you, and many die. For if we judge ourselves, how do we judge ourselves? Righteous. But many die early because they don't judge themselves, and they don't discern why they're taking it, and they look at it from an unworthy manner. That's why Paul says, don't do that. Don't take it from an unworthy manner. So we're going to take it today, and we're going to know one thing that, but well, when we are judged, we are, therefore, my brother, when you come together, that's another aspect, but, but, but I want to share that with you. Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. In the Last Supper, what did he do? He took the 12 disciples, and he said, look, this is going to happen. Now, because it's going to happen, we're going to take communion, and I want you to understand, you're healed, you're forgiven, you're not unworthy. Can you say amen? You can take... You got one? <laughs> and he broke this bread saying, here, take some more to do it. <laughs> so we're going to take the bread, but you know what? We've examined ourselves righteous. And now you're taking this knowing one thing. It's a worthy manner. And because it's a worthy manner, you're healed. You're not going to get healed. You already are. So, Father, as we take this bread, we've examined ourselves. We've examined ourselves because we're righteous. We're going to do this in remembrance of what you did on the cross. We're going to do this, and Lord, examining ourselves that as we partake of this bread, 
we see healing because of what you did on the cross. So therefore, Lord, because we're worthy and we're doing it in a worthy manner, we partake of this now, knowing that by your stripes we are healed. Let's partake. You know, when you, when you take it from a worthy manner, that's faith. Healing will manifest itself. And I believe with communion, I believe bodies will be healed because we're taking this in a worthy manner. Father, just as we took that in a worthy manner, we're going to do this in remembrance of you. Remembering what? That you forgave every sin. Remember of, remembering of, of what? What you did on the cross. We're going to look at the message of the cross and we're going to take this Grape juice in remembrance, knowing, Lord God, there is no condemnation. There is no false guilt. There is no shame. You took it all to the cross, and it cannot keep us down because we're take, partaking of this now in a worthy manner, and the devil can't keep us down because the blood lifted us up. So let us partake of it in Jesus' name. Lynn Hayes. Praise God. I have to remind myself to write a note, heavy song during communion while people are trying to open these things, you know. <laughs> Average song's about five minutes, five and a half minutes. We run a song while you're trying to... Thank God for COVID so we could use these. Okay, it's offering time. Yes. I was... Trying to, th I was thinking of, okay, Lord, what, what would you like said during offering? And he reminded me of something. Um, he reminded me of the tither's promises. And there are promises to the tither. But one of the ones that we haven't talked about that often, but is certainly beneficial in our lives, in uh, Malachi 3, not only does he say if you tithe, you're going to be blessed, and as we know, it's not just Old Testament. It was, the tithe was put to, uh, in place before the Old Testament was even, or the, Mo, the law of Moses was even created. The Old Covenant was even created. The, the tithe was uh, pl put in place during uh, Abraham's reign. But one of the tither's blessings is that God protects our stuff. God protects our stuff. He says, you know, your grapes won't fall off the vine before their time, et cetera, et cetera. And you can read it in Malachi 3. And I, I was thinking about it yesterday, and I'm thinking, you know, we have an air popcorn popper that we've had since we've been married. It's 25 years. And the things, I just, I just used it last night. And our vehicles, yeah, they don't fall apart. When we want a new one, we just trade it in. But we have them maintained. We don't have any major issues there. Our home, we don't have problems with the electrical or with the plumbing. There's so many things that God has blessed us with. They're just... They're like the Energizer Bunny. They just keep on going and going and going. And forgive me, Lord, for not thanking you for that more and more. But that is one of the tither's promises, that the enemy can't trash your stuff. It's hands off. And the word says if he does trash your stuff and you determine, yeah, this is the enemy and he's trashing my stuff, the word says he's got to pay you back sevenfold. Hallelujah. So start getting the adding machines out and adding up everything he owes you. But it's, it's something that I, I need to keep in mind. Thank you, Lord, that among other things, you bless us, you provide for us, you give us abundance, and you protect our stuff. One of the tither's blessings, one of the tither's promises. So Father, we thank you for that.
we thank you, Father, that you want to bless us so much, and you do bless us, and we thank you for that, Lord. Help us to walk in those blessings according to your way, your word, the way you want it done, Father. Amen, Father. And I do declare this congregation is 100% tithers, and they receive all of the blessings that you have for the tither. In Jesus' name, amen. Ushers? Try the handheld for a while. <clears throat> Praise you, Lord. Do I have enough water? Hmm. Okay. If you if you can't hear me or if I come down a little bit, just wave your hand or something like that, and I'll switch over to the lavalier, but usually I use this. Okay, um, interesting stuff that's happened recently. Like I said, a lot of, uh, some people are, are fighting the good fight of faith with fevers and all of this. And uh, I got a call from, past, or a text from Pastor Mark yesterday that he was uh, laid up with fever, et cetera. He, he would be scheduled to teach today but he is fighting the good fight of faith, amen, him and his family. So normally I would do the thing that a senior pastor would do, call Pastor Frank and say, you're on for tomorrow. <laughs> it's, it's, it's simple. <laughs> yes, and uh, just as a sidebar, he would say yes, because he loves to teach. <clears throat> But I was thinking about that, and the Holy Spirit stopped me and said, no, I, I, I don't want you to do that this time. I said, okay, what do you have in mind? And he took me to a particular daily devotional that I look at from a gentleman named Dutch Sheets, a, a very, uh, who's very strong in prophet. And that's, that's what we're going to be talking about today. We're going to be talking about the Holy of Holies. And uh, different twist on it, something that I had never thought of before, something I'd never considered before, um, something that opened my eyes. And he also reminded me, last month I taught on the ecclesia. That's the word that Jesus used in, in Matthew 16, 18. I believe it's 16, 18 or 18, 16, 16, 18. That's the word Jesus used for the church, the ecclesia. And it was a very specific word. And in the definition of that word lies what us, the church, what we, the church, sh who we are and what we should be doing. It's huge. And I, I hopefully unraveled that pretty good last, uh, last month. So this month, actually it's the same month, um, he took me to the Holy of Holies. And I'm thinking, okay. But then he, things started unraveling and opening up, and I'm going, wow. 
uh, it reminded me of the song, uh, a couple groups sing it, Take Me Into the Holy of Holies, Take Me In by the Blood of the Lamb. So, let's talk. Um, as many of us know, under the Old Covenant, the covenant made that God made with Moses, God had Moses construct a tabernacle, a very large tent. And within that tent, there, was, there were sides to it. There wasn't a top to it, but there were sides to it. And it was, I don't know if it was quite the size of, of a football field, but it was pretty big. You had different areas. The, what's the word I want? The importance of it was that was where God met with man. The tent was named the tabernacle of the congregation. And it appears in, first in Exodus 33, 7. And it was designated where God would meet and talk with man. It's primarily made up of three areas. Inside, in the open area inside of this tent, was the outer court. Then there was a structure toward the back of it. Uh, four sides, four walls, ceiling, floor, that was separated in two parts. The first part was called the holy place. And then the second part was called the holy of holies. And the outer court was where the Jews came. Non-Jews could not come in. The Jews came and they offered their offerings their sin offerings, their guilt offerings. Uh, they brought in uh, uh, the gifts that they had because of the abundance of their crops, the thank you offerings, et cetera, et cetera. And it's not a thank you offering, but uh, the name escapes me. In the outer court, you had a large basin containing a water. It's a laver. It was called the laver. And that's where the priests washed themselves. And then you had the altar of sacrifice where the priests burnt the offerings that were brought in by the people. And this really went on 24-7. Then you get to this inner structure, the holy place. Only one that could go into it was the priest. It contained the table of showbread. It contained the seven candle menorah and the altar of incense. And I encourage you, I, I brought these today, I have, I have many books, I brought two today. Each one of these, the size, the shape, uh, the colors, what, the decorations, uh, the constituents, what the stuff was made out of, there is such symbolism in the tabernacle and after the tabernacle, after the tent, they actually made a place of stone, the temple. There is such symbolism in them that it will blow you away. We're not going to be getting into symbolisms today that much, but just realize it, it really is amazing and everything points to Jesus. So we have the holy place, and that's where the priests ministered. But then we had the second room, the Holy of Holies, where God resided. The most holy place on the planet. It's where man met God and God met man. There's only one person on the planet that could go in there, and that was the high priest. And he could only go in one day for the entire year. The day where the sacrifices were made for the sins of Israel. Holy, most sacred. What was in there was the Ark of the Covenant. And there was a number of things inside the Ark of the Covenant. The Ten Commandments were in there representing the law. 
also representing grace, if you will, because it ties in with, with the New Testament a little bit. So they have the Ten Commandments, Aaron's rod that budded. It's represent, the only one that could come in was a Levite. You had to be a Levite to be a priest. And then the, there was a container of manna, and that represented the prosperity that God had for the nation when they obeyed. One day a year, the high priest went in to make sacrifices for all the sins of Israel. And if he goofed up, there was problems. If you read about it, I, I find this fascinating. He had, to, he had to make sacrifices for himself first, so he was cleansed before he went in. And if he goofed up there, that was a real problem. They actually had a rope tied on him. The, the garbs that he wore had pomegranates and bells sewn in on the bottom. And I remember teaching on this one time way back when I said that when he walked, he tinkled. <laughs> and a few people told me that's probably not the right way to describe it. His, his bells went ding dong, ding dong. They, they tied a rope around his leg because if he really goofed up, he'd be stricken down, he'd be dead. Do you think anyone was going, and going to go in and get him? No way. They, they would drag him out. But for the Jews, the temple was everything. It represented their society, it represented their God, their triumphs through God. It was where God accepted their sacrifices for their transgressions. It was where the people would bring their thanksgiving offerings. And it was where the presence of God was. The very presence of God. So, a neat picture, but God had so much more in mind. And through the blood of Christ, he can and does have things. God wants to dwell with his people, wanted to dwell with his people continually. Not just one day a year, but continually. And through the blood of Christ, he can do that. Uh, as you may know, there is no temple anymore. There's a wall, one wall of the temple. The Romans trashed Jerusalem and trashed the temple as well in 70 A.D., and you might remember Jesus coming down uh, from the mount. And people, uh, his disciples were saying, wow, what a temple. I mean, this thing was stunning. There, were, there was a number of them. There was Solomon's temple. There was uh, um, good old, what's his name? Uh, uh, okay. Someone holler it out. Uh, he, 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 um, who was the governor that, that had the temple built? Herod. Herod's temple. I'm sorry, I didn't hear what you said, John. But, uh, but in 70 AD, the Romans trashed the temple. And Jesus said, you know, it's a great looking building, but there's going to be a time when not one stone will be upon the other. <clears throat> and from what I've read, uh, the way it rolled out, it was that the Romans were told that there was gold in the mortar that was used in between the stones. So they ripped every, they separated all the stones to get the mortar, to get the gold. I don't believe there was gold, but um, if you go there today, it, it's, you have one wall left. There will be another one built before Christ comes back. That's very clear, though. So where is the Holy of Holies? Today, where is the Holy of Holies? In us. We are the Holy of Holies of God. When I started to wrap my brain around that, because I'd never thought of that before. You know, I know God's in me, you know, God in us, the hope of glory and all that, but I never realized, my Lord. I am the holy of holies of God. 
Wrap your mind around that. I am the holy. You are the holy of holies where God resides. The very presence of God dwells in the heart of every Christian believer. I don't know if you've ever thought about that, but I hadn't, to be honest with you. We hold the very presence of the living God inside us. I find that amazing. In the Holy of Holies, and we're going to be starting to look at the parallels. We need to realize this. In the Old Testament, if there was any place guarded by God, it was the Holy of Holies. Interestingly enough, if there's any person guarded by God today, it's you and me. If we go to Psalm 121, 5 through 8 from New King James. The Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade at your right hand. The sun shall not strike you by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord shall preserve you from all evil. He shall preserve your soul. The Lord shall preserve your going out and your coming in from this time forth and even forevermore. God was so protective of the Holy of Holies. Transmit that into us. He is so protective of us because we are the Holy of Holies. Like I said, we're going to be looking at some commonalities between the Old Testament Holy of Holies and the New Testament. The Ark of the Covenant, as I mentioned, was housed in the Temple of the Holy of Holies. It contained the Ten Commandments, the Word of the Law. It also contained Aaron's rod, as evidenced by the, and evidenced the exclusive right of the priesthood of the tribe of Levi. And the manna, which God provided during the time of his, his children were wandering, it showed provision. Today, our spirit carries that. We carry the word of God in our heart. Hearts. We carry the word of the new covenant and all the promises it contains in us. The authority of the new covenant we carry within us and we can speak it out. And the blessings and the provision of the new covenant we can speak forth as well. All of that is contained in us. It's interesting that the items, if you, if you look and Google it, um, the Solomon's Temple, and when you walk into the Holy of Holies, there was these two gigantic uh, angels either side of the Ark of the Covenant. They were guards. The Spirit was showing that the Ark of the Covenant was surrounded and guarded by angels. Bringing it to us, we are that Ark of the Covenant. We are the Ark of the Covenant. And God himself protects us. Let's go to 1 Corinthians 6, 9 first. I find it amazing that God has chosen to abide in me, in you. I like 1 Corinthians six nineteen, Or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and who are not, and you are not your own? I never thought of myself as a temple. Before I got saved, I tried to think of myself as a Greek god once in a while. <laughs> that, that didn't go too far, I'll tell you. <laughs> uh, why am I thinking every Greek god I saw had hair? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Praise God. But we are surrounded and protected by angels. And there's angels in here right now. And there's people in this congregation that see them. I'm, I'm believing one day I am going to see them. But a lot of times after I preach, someone will come up and say, you know what, there was a big angel behind you, there's one over here, there's one over here. And apparently there's one that, that just stays there. Is he up there? He's up there. Praise God. 
Hebrews 1, 13 and 14. But to which of the angels has he ever said, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies a footstool? Are they, the angels, not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister for those who will inherit salvation? They minister to us. And I haven't heard a lot of teaching on angels and their ministry to us. I, I need to dig into that myself. But they, we are surrounded and protected by angels. As we know, as we talked, only the high priest could, ex could access the Holy of Holies. And only the, the great high priest can access your spirit. Now, we've got to separate here. We know that we are a spirit. We live in a body. We have a soul. We are a spirit. So I'm not talking about soul and body. I'm talking about spirit. Only God can access, once we're saved, can access our spirit. Let's go to Romans 8, 38 and 9. For I am convinced and continue to be convinced beyond any doubt that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor anything present or threatening, nor any things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the unlimited love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. 1 Corinthians 6, 19. We just said it before. Do you not know that the body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is within you, whom you have received as a gift from God and that you are not your own property? Uh, the amplified version that I have says, do you not know that the body, that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is within you, whom you have received as a gift from God, and that you are not your own property? Verse 20, you were bought with a price. You were actually purchased with the precious blood of Jesus and made his own. So then honor and glorify God with your body. We are God's property. He purchased us with the blood of Christ. Satan doesn't have any right to our spirits. He doesn't own them. He's going to try, but he can't succeed. That's why he attacks the soul. The mind, the will, and the emotions make up the soul. That's why he attacks the soul. He can't attack the spirit. Our spirits are Christ's. Our spirits are God's. Thank you, Lord. Your life is not up for grabs. You are not easy prey for the enemy. The people knew the Holy of Holies was off limits. The devil and his demons know that you, your spirit is off limits. He tries to lie to you to deceive you and gain illegal entrance. But the Holy of Holies, our spirit, can't be touched. Something good. So, at least in my mind's eye, that answers the question, can a Christian be, uh, I just had the word in my mind, possessed, thank you. I don't believe so. I don't believe a Christian can be possessed, because that is the spirit. Can his mind be, can a person's mind be warped? Can their soul be taken over? Possibly, but you can't touch your spirit. Okay, next. The blood was applied to the lid of the Ark of the Covenant called the mercy seat, which contained the law of God, thereby redeeming the people from the curse of the law. And the blood has been applied to you and me, redeeming us from the curse of the law. And if you blow that out and, and really look at it, there's a the, the heavenly... Ark of the Covenant and the mercy seat is actually in heaven. The word says that God actually looks on the mercy seat and sees the blood. He doesn't see the sin. He sees the blood. Every, I believe every 
mother, son, and daughter that is Christian because we carry what we carry and because we are the New Testament, Ark of the Covenant, we have the blood on us. And when God sees us, he doesn't see our sin. He doesn't see our shortcomings. He sees the blood. I believe that with all my heart. Galatians 3, 13 and 14. Christ purchased our freedom and redeemed us from the curse of the law and its condemnation by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who hangs, crucified on a tree or a cross, in order that Christ Jesus, that in Christ Jesus the blessing of Abraham might also come to the Gentiles, so that we would all receive the realization of the promise of the Holy Spirit through faith. The blood was applied. And I, I hear people say, and rightfully so, you know, when we plead the blood, and I, I've done teachings on it, and I know a number of us have done teachings on it, when we plead the blood, that terminology isn't that we're begging, we're pleading. No, it's a legal term. If someone is charged with a crime, a judge, that person will stand before a judge, and the judge will say, how do you plead, innocent or guilty? We plead, not innocent or guilty, we plead the blood. Wrap your mind around that. We plead the blood. Jesus, that takes care of everything else. And that blood has been splashed on the mercy seat. And because we are the New Testament Ark of the Covenant in the spirit realm, that blood has been applied to us as well. The presence and power of God manifested in many tangible ways to the people of God. But the Holy of Holies was the epicenter of his presence. We are now the carrier of God's presence and of his anointing. Through our lives, burdens are removed from people. Yokes are destroyed. We walk in the power of the Spirit. Think about that a minute. We carry the anointing of the living Christ. We carry the anointing of God. I love Mark 16 uh, 17 from the Amplified. It says, These signs, this is Jesus giving the, last, the, the final commission before he's taken up to heaven. These signs will accompany those who believe. In my name, they will cast out demons. They will speak in new tongues. Go to 18. I'm sorry, Rich. Thank you. They will pick up serpents, and if they drink anything deadly, it will not hurt them. They will lay hands on the sick, and they will get well. And if you really get into the epistles, so, so, so many places tell us the authority that we have because we are the containers that contain God. And obviously, you can't contain God. The universe can't contain God. I don't know what's past the universe. We'll find out when we, we might find out when we get to heaven. But we are many containers of the anointing that was given Christ. And we can do things. We can walk in the power of the Spirit because he has given us the authority to walk in the power of the Spirit. The word declares that we are the temple of the Holy Spirit. As your life contains the very life, spirit, and presence of God, as 1, as 1 Corinthians 16, 19 states, out of our bellies flow the river of living water. 
That was neat too. That that wasn't that. That song wasn't in our repertoire when we practiced on uh, Wednesday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Tuesday. That wasn't in our repertoire. Paula put it in yesterday, I believe, didn't you? And I was back there going, when you were speaking about it, I'm going, yes, yes, preach it. I love when God does that. <clears throat> Out of our bellies flow the river of living water. We are the holy of holies, the most holy place. The enemy tries to convince us that we are much less than what God says we are. Sometimes we see ourselves small, insignificant, and unworthy. If we could only know the depth of our value and how God sees us. And that, that's my prayer, not only for you, but for me. Help me to see, Lord, how you see me. Help me to know the depth of my value. Not, not in a pride, prideful way, but in a way that he can use. Because if I don't think I can do it, I'm not even going to try it. But if he's assured me, yes, you can do it, then I will try it. In the midst of God's people, Israel, he would come in visitation into the tabernacle and into the temple. But in us, he does not visit, he dwells. That's huge. That's huge. One of my prayers is, Lord, that I recognize you in me more and more and more. He's there all the time. He's, he's, I, I, I don't see a, um, him coming and going and coming and going, you know, parking on the side and hopping in and going out and moving. No, he's there. The Holy Spirit is there all of the time. Unfortunately, I don't realize that at times. Unfortunately, I don't think like that at times. And my prayer is, Lord, help me to think like that more and more. He does not visit, he dwells. He has made his holy habitation in our hearts. Out of God's most holy place comes his promises. His promises of his word, his authority, and his provision. And today, we have his promises. They are better promises than what was given in the Old Testament. <clears throat> Out of our spirits, we can release God's word concerning his covenant with mankind. That's what he wants us to do. Out of our spirits, we can release the word concerning the authority of our covenant. And out of our spirits, we can release the word concerning provision out of our covenant. God has set us in the midst of a world that is lost and without a shepherd. The, the more I, I look up, at the world, the more I just shake my head and go, oh, my Lord, my Lord, my Lord, my Lord. <clears throat> but out of us, out of our lives, anointing, authority, and provision can flow to the world. From our belly can come the very essence of who God is. I, I love this one. I thought, this is really good, Lord. Do not be surprised when people seek you out because of what you carry. How many times has that happened? I don't know why I'm coming to you, but I, I, I just want to ask you this, or whatever. Although they will seek you out in the natural realm, I believe they are looking for God's supernatural realm. So let's walk in the supernatural and that is coming, that is not only coming, that is here more and more and more. And I'm seeing it all over Western New York. Do not fear being a carrier of God's anointing to the nations. Do not allow the enemy to minimize who you are or what you carry. You and I are God's New Testament ark. We are God's most holy place. The blood of the Lamb has been applied spiritually upon the seat of our hearts, 
and realize what that means. It means healing flows from us. Health flows from us. Wholeness flows from us. Anointing flows from us. Blessings flow from us. And freedom flows from us. And a whole lot more. In a dark and troubled world, we are the epicenter of God's presence. God's grace, God's love, and God's anointing. God has poured out on us a priestly anointing that rises up to destroy the yokes and strongholds of a lost world. And how many places in the New Testament are we called priests of the Most High God? Speak and decree the release today of that which is inside you. It is too precious to keep it locked inside the deep chamber of our spirits. It was never designed by God to be buried. Open our mouths, stretch forth our hands, extend our lives, and watch what the Holy Spirit does. It'll blow you away. Well, not away, it'll, it'll surprise you. No, it'll blow you away. Watch what the Holy Spirit does. Because all he wants is a vessel that says yes. He doesn't look at your application form. He doesn't look at your biography. He doesn't look at your CV. All he needs is someone that says yes. God wants the word, the authority, and the provision of our covenant contained in each of us to be released into the wilderness that people are in today, the lost world. And I believe that for today, for this period in time in history is so important. Obviously, it is. And that's what our assignment is, to release God's anointing, God's power, God's presence, God's love, God's grace, God's mercy, to a dying nation, to a dying world. So I encourage you, just say yes and watch what the Holy Spirit does. Amen? Amen. Father, we thank you for your word, the power of your word, the authority of your word. We thank you, Lord, that, my Lord, you have made us the holy of holies of the new covenant, Lord. I thank you for that. I thank you for the trust you have in us. And I thank you for the package that was delivered, your anointing, your promises, your word, your name. And that you will never leave us. You will, no, will never forsake us. And I thank you for what you're doing and going to do through us. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. You are dismissed. Oh, there's food in the kitchen. Uh, free food in the kitchen, so avail yourselves of it. Um, also, I was told there is some clothing in the fellowship room. Uh, if you want to wander over and take a look and see what you'd like, it's, it's there uh, if you'd like it.